Oi, Mr. Government, what are you going to do with my crypto then? That's the question being asked, albeit not in an English farmer's accent, all across the decentralized web at the moment as US regulatory discussions concerning digital assets gather pace. But what regulation, how and why? That's the question we're going to be answering today. We are taking the deepest of deep dives into how the relatively centralized and regulated American nation state is contemplating reining in the decentralized, danger-filled and sexy wild west of borderless cryptocurrency. Welcome to CryptoSnap. In March of this year, tens of thousands of players were logged onto Axie Infinity collecting smooth love potions and playing with their cuddly, adorable little Axies in Lunatia, blissfully unaware of the impeding calamity about to befall them. A few weeks later, their precious SLP would be devalued 85%, essentially making all of their hard work for nothing. Just like that time, I put six hours into playing Final Fantasy VIII, but then knocked the power cord out before I could save. Turns out Lazarus, the infamous hacking group allegedly operated by the North Korean state and not the resurrected man from the biblical tale, although that would be quite humorous, had exploited the platform's Ronan Bridge on March 29th to the tune of $625 million. We did do a video on bridge hacks and why bridges are so vulnerable to attack. If you do want to check it out, it's in the comments below. But yes, ever since Bitcoin's genesis block was first mined, crypto and criminals have been bonded together like Thelma and Louise, Bonnie and Clyde, Elon and Floki. I mean, crypto's a decentralized, often anonymous means of paying people and storing funds with millions of dollars of value sitting out in open ledgers for all to examine. Of course it's going to attract illicit attention, and that's why exploits like the Ronan Bridge hack are becoming a gargantuan problem for the space. There's also been Solana's wormhole bridge hack, which saw $320 million disappear, the Beanstalk stablecoin exploit to the tune of $180 million, and the exploit of the Ethereum Binance Bridge Harmony, which saw $100 million go poof, which was also Lazarus, by the way. And these were all just this year alone. In fact, things have gotten so bad that Chainalysis reports that nearly $2 billion worth of cryptocurrency has been stolen from DeFi platforms in 2022. So what's a good old US government got to do to stop all this crypto exploiting madness? Which for scale, the average hack is 1.4 times larger than America's largest ever cash robbery. Average hack. Well, mainly it's gone after the criminal's Achilles heel, the cashing out bit. The Office of Foreign Assets Control, or OFAC, recently blacklisting Tornado Cash. For those who don't know it, Tornado Cash is what's called a crypto mixer. It works by bundling up lots of other deposits, shaking them all up and down like a Tommy's margarita, and then sending the desired amount from the pool to the desired address. Hey presto, the result is that it becomes impossible to determine what funds came from what address. So OFAC banned it, meaning that any US-based crypto user who interacts with the service can face extremely serious criminal penalties. Fines for non-compliance can range from $50,000 to 10 million. And if that wasn't enough, you could also land a prison sentence of up to 30 freaking years for using it. And on top of that, Dutch authorities arrested Alex Pertsev, the suspected developer of Tornado Cash. And according to reports, he's considered such a high security risk He's not even being allowed to talk to his wife for developing open source code. You see, all of this entire Tornado Cash saga raises massive moral and legal questions that I'm not sure have been sufficiently thought through. I bet very few people, the regulators included, would be willing to have a public record of their bank statements available online for all to gawk at. So why can't crypto folks have a legitimate means of ensuring their own fiscal privacy? Privacy being the key word here as it's a robustly defended implied right under constitutional law and indeed explicitly outlined under Article 12 of the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights. And I'm not even getting started on Pertsev's arrest. That's like arresting a suitcase designer for the actions of a drug smuggler. Just because one thing is built by somebody and then misused by another doesn't mean there's a causal link of legal moral responsibility. No, it just 
No, it doesn't make sense to me. And it l doesn't make sense to a lot of people, including some vigilante crypto folk who have been deliberately dusting high profile crypto wallets like Coinbase CEO Brian Armstrong and YouTuber Logan Paul with small amounts of ETH sent via Tornado Cash in order to blacklist their wallets and highlight how troubled the regulation is. A perk of being famous, it seems, is that people send you money to discredit you. Now, before we move on from this section entirely, we have to quickly cover off two other areas in crypto where crime is a distinct possibility and therefore where we might expect regulation in the future. The first is NFT wash trading. This is the act of taking dirty crypto money, then buying an NFT you secretly already own to wash the funds and make them seem as squeaky clean as a prize poodle just back from the groomers. Wash trading can also mean selling an NFT to yourself over and over again to artificially increase its perceived value because people think they're legitimate transactions and the price is just going up and up and up. Last year, the US Treasury did raise some concerns about the use of NFTs for criminal purposes in a study which said that the department will begin, quote, looking at what might be needed to address money laundering risks in the digital arts industry. Senators Thom Tillis and Patrick Leahy also said that intellectual property laws for artwork NFTs need to be urgently clarified, but they didn't mention anything specifically as to money laundering. So in short, it doesn't really sound like any legislation on the quite problematic issue will be coming into force anytime soon. And now our last area in crypto crime regulation to look at swiftly is privacy coins. These are cryptocurrencies like Monero and Zcash. Or is that Zcash? Is that a British American thing? Basically, these have built in anonymity features that can make them a very easy way of obfuscating the source of the funds. They can do things like change your address every time you make a transaction or hide the balance of your wallet if you choose to do so. Again, these sort of coins are widely used in crime. A whopping 44% of all ransomware attacks reported in 2018, which admittedly is a little bit dated, that involved the use of Monero, for example. However, the legitimate privacy arguments we saw with Tornado Cash are also applicable here too. But as it stands, the US hasn't actually taken any direct action on their usage yet. Although in Australia and South Korea, crypto exchanges are banned from listing such coins, and in Japan, even simply using privacy coins is illegal. So for Americans, legal for now, but how long that stays true remains to be seen. Something you'll have to consider if you do have privacy coins in your wallet. Everyone hates paying taxes, yet everyone, for the most part, has to do it. They're a universal fact of life, like the act of being born, the act of dying, and the act of going ah, when you stub your toe. So of course, you can't escape the clutches of the tax person in crypto either. But how crypto is taxed is a bit counterintuitive. You see, for the purposes of tax, the IRS considers crypto to be a property, not like its name implies, a currency. It's a house, not a $100 bill. What this means is crypto assets themselves are not taxable. So if your Bitcoin sees some dank gains of 22% over the weekend, yeah, good luck. You're not liable to pay any tax on that increase. However, therein lies the rub. If you convert your crypto to fiat currency through a centralized exchange and withdraw it to your bank account, or even if you buy an NFT, you are liable to pay something called capital gains tax. And in the US, the amount you have to pay depends on what state you're living in. Which segues perfectly into the TradingView Most Crypto-Friendly States Award, what we've called the Golden Nodes. For the bronze medal, it's the Lone Star State. Texas is the fourth most popular state for Bitcoin mining, which is not only because of how cheap electricity is there, it's also because crypto miners can get some pretty juicy tax breaks. But the real sweetener, Texas doesn't have any additional capital gains tax on top of the federal taxes you have to pay regardless. All right, all right, all right. In second place is Nevada, which is one of the few states that legally recognizes the legality of blockchains for keeping financial records. Aside from that, it's also passed a bill in 2017 banning local governments from taxing blockchain transactions. Plus, you don't need to pay any extra state-mandated capital gains tax on crypto profits. Get in. But the state that takes the biscuit for our first place is Wyoming. 
aside from waiving crypto-related capital gains taxes at a state level, it's also gone the extra mile by passing laws that encourage the creation of crypto banks. It's got cheap energy prices for mining, a state blockchain task force for luring prospective crypto businesses in. It's even gone so far as to allow decentralized autonomous organizations or DAOs to register as limited liability companies. All of this makes it one of the most, in fact, the most in our books, crypto-friendly states in America. While the regulations governing crypto taxation are fairly static for now, what is changing is the political backing for the IRS to up its game and go after the taxable money being left on the table in America, which IRS Chief Charles Rettig believes constitutes about a trillion dollars every year. In fact, the federal government is so convinced of the potential for income from unpaid taxes that the White House gave the IRS an extra $80 billion to crack down on tax dodgers, including those parking their cash in crypto. We're starting to see the effects of this recently, the IRS winning a ruling on August 15th that required cryptocurrency broker SFOX to produce trading records for users who conducted trades totaling at least $20,000, pursuant to what's called a John Doe summons. Essentially, this is a battering ram of a tool where the IRS doesn't know who's not paid them taxes, double negative there, but who has got judicial approval to just go and root through confidential documents to find out who might not be paying them in this case by looking at the broker's records directly. There's a lot, lot, lot more we could cover when it comes to crypto taxation. It's a big, expansive topic and it's quite complicated. But the long and short of it is you need to make sure your affairs are in order tax-wise and you're clued up on what is and what isn't taxable when it comes to crypto. If in doubt, it may even be worth checking out software providers like Cointracker, TokenTax, CryptoTrader.tax and Coinly, who can help simplify what you should and shouldn't be paying. Or just renounce your citizenship, move to Monaco, buy a mega yacht, and don't worry about anything. It's what the rich do, right? One of the big old lumbering questions on the minds of the clever boffins in the US government's employ right now is, are crypto securities? And they don't really seem to have made up their minds, at least not yet. To recap, a security is a fungible, that is interchangeable and negotiable financial instrument that holds some type of financial value. They're highly regulated in the US under the 1933 Securities Act enforced by the SEC. Because of the possibility for investors to be otherwise defrauded by shiny yet completely unvetted promises of massive gains. As a result, failure to comply with the Securities Act can be really, really bad for crypto companies. How bad? Well, Bloom, a blockchain solution for credit scoring, was threatened with a $31 million fine last month, unless its tokens were immediately registered with the agency. And earlier this year, crypto bank BlockFi was fined an eye-watering $100 million for failing to register its offerings with the SEC. In fact, since 2013, a whopping $2.4 billion of fines have been issued because of breaches of securities regulation in the crypto space. That being said though, the SEC chair Gary Gensler has agreed that the OG cryptocurrency Bitcoin is not, repeat, not a security. His reasoning being it fails to pass something called the Howey test, which is a yardstick for determining whether something can be considered a security using four basic checks. Those parts being an investment of money in a common enterprise with the expectation of profit to be derived from the efforts of others. When you invest in Bitcoin, the derived from the efforts of others bit doesn't really hold water as the blockchain is so dispersed and users so unaffiliated that you're not really relying on anybody else's specific efforts for a profit to be created. So it's probably not a security and as such probably should come under the purview of the Commodities Future Trading Commission or CFTC, which has, well, it has a bit of a reputation for being more responsive and dare I say it less strict with their regulations. Essentially, like with many areas of crypto regulation, confusion and indecision abound about which agency is responsible for what coin or token. Indeed, in June, US senators introduced a bill to the Senate trying to address and better delineate the playgrounds of the SEC and the CFTC, and basically put a bit of a clamp on the SEC unilaterally trying to regulate everything crypto related. It is gonna be a while before that bill goes anywhere though, but that plus the ongoing is Ripple a security lawsuit that's been dragging on longer than the latest Jurassic Park movie could come to be major deciding factors on the fate of multiple cryptocurrencies, including ones you may own. Even Ethereum, maybe, probably not. 
Now, stablecoins are most certainly not securities, as there is no expectation of profit as per point three of the Howey test, but they're a big deal nonetheless, as the market cap of the stablecoin industry sits at around $150 billion right now. That makes up around 15% of the value of the entire crypto sector, and it's growing. With numbers like that, it's no wonder that the ears of regulators have pricked up for stablecoins specifically. In their eyes, because of the lending and borrowing service usually associated with stablecoins, big players like Tether and Circle are beginning to add just a teensy tiny, teeny, teeny, tiny, teeny bit like banks, but without all the rules, red tape, consumer protection and drab foyers that go along with them. So it's pretty likely that in the next few months, or at least by the end of the year, we'll probably see some sort of sweeping regulation washing across the stablecoin sector like a thunderstorm rippling across a quiet prairie. The no-brainer change most people agree on, including some crypto folk, is that stablecoins should be fully fiat-backed. That is, for every token they issue, they have a real-world dollar sitting somewhere backing it up. Although whether these greenbacks are held at a state level or a federal one is a bit of a discussion point right now. The biggest impetus for this move, though, is of course the catastrophic collapse of the non-fiat-backed algorithmic stablecoin UST. We did a like it was a massive deep dive into why this went so calamitously wrong. So I won't cover it again here, but I will encourage you to check out that video if you're interested, and I'll leave a link in the description below. A more controversial discussion point on stablecoins surrounds who should be allowed to issue them. Should it be federally insured banks as the president's working group on financial markets recommended, or can state regulators charter them too? The questions are numerous and the decisions are few, but with over 100 countries currently working on central bank digital currencies, the US simply cannot afford to, afford to fall behind on digital innovation that the stablecoin-like assets provide, and these challenges will have to be dealt with at some point. What does this mean for you, though? Well, any introduction of new regulations could have a profound effect on your stablecoin holdings, especially if you have any algorithmic ones. It's worth perhaps having a Google alert on for the following bills, which are at various stages of discussion at the moment. These include the Stablecoin Transparency of Reserves and Uniform Safe Transactions Act, Trust Act, the Stablecoin Innovation and Protection Act, and the Responsible Financial Innovation Act. Or you could just keep up to date with our TradingView snaps on tradingview.com instead, because if anything major happens with any of these bills, we'll cover it there. We even send out a daily email with quick bites on the news and upcoming earnings reports if you're into stock trading. Plus, we have a nice artwork at the end of every roundup for you. You can sign up by logging into your TradingView account and then using the link included in the description below to enable daily email sends. Okay, there we have it. Crypto regs in a nutshell, at least for the moment. But what do you think about it all? Is regulation necessary for the crypto space to go fully mainstream? Or are these government agencies overstepping the mark somewhat? We want to hear your thoughts, so do leave them in the comments below. And of course, if you're liking these videos, do give them a like and subscribe to the channel. As ever, all your feedback, support and criticism helps us make better shows in the future. Until next time though, whatever jurisdiction you're hodling in, always remember to look first, then leave.